I'm going to talk to you today about our work on our comprehensive care physician program, which is a program that we've designed to improve the care for patients at high risk of hospitalization. I think everyone in the room is well aware that the U.S. has an incredible problem with costs and poor outcomes among a significant fraction of its population. As we look at that problem, one thing we know for sure is that a large fraction of those costs are concentrated in a small fraction of the population. We also know that hospitalization costs are a big component of costs for those individuals. Moreover, the coordination of care for those individuals is extremely difficult, um, particularly coordination of care in and out of the hospital. Fortunately, a variety of incentives are increasingly encouraging the healthcare system to try to address these problems. Unfortunately, solutions for these problems are, are not easy. This is not a new problem. The problem of coordinating inpatient and outpatient care has been a, a clear one for at least a quarter of a century. And for that time, Medicare has tried a whole variety of interventions to try to address it. Unfortunately, as many of those have um, failed to improve the problem as um, have, have made it better. And on average, the government, the Congressional Budget Office included these programs don't work. Most of these programs are based on hiring care coordinators. So this is someone who talks to the doctor in the hospital and talks to the doctor in the clinic and hopefully talks to the patient, but often doesn't. These programs have been studied and they work a little better the more communication there is, but on average, they don't work. And you can sort of see in the bottom of the figure why this is so challenging. We spend a little bit of money on ambulatory care. We spend a lot of money on hospital care. We want to shrink that total amount. But as we do so and try to pay for care coordination, we can't really shrink ambulatory care because it's not very much money. And we can't shrink hospital care enough to actually make this better. I would like to tell you that this problem is improving, but it's not. In fact, it's getting worse because we've had a tremendous change in the way we deliver hospital care in the United States with the growth of hospitalists. It used to be that if you were sick, your primary care doctor saw you in the hospital and they saw you, um, at the, of course, in clinic because they were your primary care doctor. Hospitalists came in about two decades ago. They were hoped to be experts in hospital care to, um, to lower costs, improve outcomes, but the problem is they didn't know the patient. There were these discontinuities in the loss of the doctor-patient relationship. And the net effect, they didn't really solve the problem. Now this raises the question, if hospitalists really aren't better, why in the world did they grow? And the answer um, is sort of twofold. One is that people thought they would be better, and probably they were wrong. But we think that the stronger reason that they grew is that they grew to meet the needs not of hospital care, but the needs of primary care. The problem being that primary care doctors, who were increasingly caring for large numbers of healthy people trying to keep them well, could be busy all day long seeing patients in clinic and not have enough patients in the hospital hospital the next day to justify blocking their mornings to see patients in the hospital, which they had previously done. And so we've, um, as physicians organized in groups, it was natural for them to turn over their work of seeing patients in the hospitals to their primary care doctors, or rather to hospitalists. So what I just told you is a theory. Since I am a Harris School professor and an economist, I love to test theories with math. We've done this and written out um, um, equations that help us understand the time costs of the old model of care where um, physicians saw patients both in clinic and in the hospital and they had to sort of drive between the two places compared to the new model where one doctor is always in clinic, another doctor is always in the hospital, and now they have to communicate with each other. When you analyze those data, what you discover is you get a set of predictions about which primary care doctors will turn over their work to hospitalists. Um, in particular, you find that um, admissions fall relative to ambulatory visits, they should turn over that work. As communication costs decline, they should turn over that work. As transport costs rise, likewise turn over the work. And then finally, as physicians work fewer hours. In fact, all of these things have happened in the US. And in our empirical analysis, we find every single one of these predicted variables explains why hospitalists grew and why primary care doctors stopped seeing their own patients. So from this, it's extremely easy to conclude that this old model, where you were actually cared for by a doctor who knew you, just no longer makes economic sense. And so sadly, we have to give that up. But before we give it up, let's understand what we're losing in this. And what we're losing, unfortunately, is profound. There is a rich literature showing the value of the doctor-patient relationship. The trust, 
the interpersonal relationship, communication between the doctor and the patient, and the knowledge of the patients. We also know patients want to see their own doctors in the hospital. Moreover, there are some extraordinary observational studies showing that, for example, Medicare patients who are cared for by their own doctor have 15% um, lower um, costs. Moreover, lung cancer patients who are cared for by their own doctor in their terminal hospitalization, so futile care, are much less likely to go to the ICU. So those are observational studies. You can criticize them on that basis. But here's an experimental study. It's really an extraordinary study. It was done in the 1980s in the Veterans Administration. They randomized 800 patients either to see the same doctor in every clinic visit or a completely different doctor in every clinic visit. What did they find? Those with continuing care from the same doctor had 49% lower hospitalizations, 38% lower hospital days, 74% lower ICU days. In other words, having a doctor who knows you really matters. So we conclude that this discontinuity is harmful and costly, especially for these um, complex patients. So, but what do we do about it? Well, this is where the idea comes in. If the problem is doctors can no longer care for their patients in the hospital because they don't have enough patients in the hospital on a daily basis, what if you have a subset of doctors who only care for patients at um, high risk of hospitalization? So they can have a much smaller clinic of patients, small enough that they can care for them only in the afternoon, and yet every morning have the morning free to see doctors in the hospital the way they used to do it. So we call that the comprehensive care physician model. And essentially what we do is we sort patients into two groups, one at low risk of hospitalization. They almost never go to the hospital, but if they do, they get a hospitalist, but we don't have to worry about them because they almost never go to the hospital. And then this group at high risk of hospitalization who gets the same doctor in and out of the hospital. What are the advantages of this model? Most frequently hospitalized patients get their own doctor in these settings. This is valued by patients. It decreases unnecessary testing and treatment. It makes the work much easier for the doctor to do. Instead of going into the room and asking the patient, who are you? You say, Mrs. Smith, what happened last night? Um, all hospitalized patients get their own doctor, and these can be experts in specialized illnesses if you happen to have a particular or um, medical problem. Patients can choose their own doctor, which they can't with a um, hospitalist. This can work practically for a physician. You can use this to um, um, work in a new model of care, such as a patient-centered medical home. And if you've got a small hospital that's struggling to fill beds, you can hire a few doctors who can do this and help keep the hospital in business. What are the challenges? Will doctors, will patients switch? Will doctors let patients switch? Will doctors do this job? And can it be economically viable? So we got developed this idea. The Affordable Care Act was passed. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was created. We were funded in 2012 to actually build this model out at the University of Chicago. We did a good, rigorous study. We recruited 2,000 patients. We randomly assigned 1,000 to this new CCP model of care, with care in and out of the hospital, and 1,000 to sort of standard care with different doctors in and out of the hospital. And then we designed this study to understand whether this improved patient experience, whether it improved health outcomes, and importantly, whether it decreased resource utilization, particularly hospitalization. Let me say that when we designed this study, all the patients had to be willing to switch doctors. So they often weren't very happy when they're doctors um, to begin with. So we didn't just compare ourselves to doctors people didn't like, because that wouldn't be a very interesting study. We actually got them a new doctor, okay? Just one who wouldn't see them in and out of the hospital like ours would. So these are the key elements of the program design. We focused on patients at increased risk of hospitalization. We maximized direct interaction of the patients with these doctors. We built a very tight interdisciplinary team of doctors and nurses and social workers who worked together we kept the costs low by a small, intimate team. We focused on improving care um, transitions. We developed models that would work both under fee-for-service and new payment models. We tried to support the team psychologically because this is an extremely sick population. We used rapid cycle innovation techniques, and I've told you we did a rigorous um, randomized trial. Um, we collected data um, both by interviewing patients every three months from the time they were enrolled in the intervention and control groups and also looking at claims data. And we analyzed it using all of those methods that you in the Harris School are, are learning. <laughs> the patients were beautifully matched. It was a randomized trial. At baseline, they were the same in age and gender and income and baseline health characteristics. 
but after they were randomized, things really changed. Um, the patients who um, stayed um, at baseline, as I said, in terms of patient experience, they were identical. The patients in the control group actually got way better. Why? Because we got them a new doctor. They went from the 20th percentile in satisfaction to the 80th percentile. The CCP program went to the 95th percentile and stayed there not just through one year, but actually through two years. We didn't see any changes in general health status. That seemed like that was the same in the two groups. Mental health status, on the other hand, dramatically improved. And people told us that they loved the psychological support. But in terms of the budgetary problems that we face in our healthcare system, it's utilization that matters most. And here's really the remarkable result, that we found a 20% sustained reduction in hospitalization rate over two years. Here's just out to one year, but the data actually goes beyond that. Let me talk about what we learned from all of this. We learned, first of all, it was possible to take this theoretical idea and actually implement it. But critically, this reduction of 20% hospitalization over two years translates into a number needed to treat of four. In other words, you enroll four patients in this program for one year and you, present, you prevent one hospitalization. That means a savings of about three to $4,000 per patient per year. At our hospital alone, five doctors doing this saved about $4 million for Medicare. You you translate this into what this potentially means if replicated nationally, you're talking about tens of billions of dollars annually. Meanwhile, while improving outcomes. There are limitations. These are self-reported outcomes. We've got some Medicare data, but not, not all of it yet. We had challenges in Illinois because Medicare um, changed its relation to Medicaid during this um, period with something called the Medicare-Medicaid Alignment Initiative, which led to some disruptions in our ability to track data, unfortunately. And of course, this is only one program in only one place. Um, and so much more work um, needs to be done. Next steps, we're continuing these analyses here at the University of Chicago um, and also um, expanding them elsewhere. Um, we're working in sh the Chicago area with Ingalls Hospital, a community hospital in the south suburbs and building the program out there. And then we've been busy spreading this all around the US and internationally. Vanderbilt, Kaiser, National University of Singapore. We've recently been working with the National Health Service in the UK. Medicare has funded us for a learning collaborative to spread this. And, um, Medicare committee has actually recommended a new funding model to support this, um, which unfortunately is stuck in the Secretary of Health and Human Services office at the moment. Um, we are busy engaging other institutions to try this model and spread it. And then finally, let me say that um, this is just the beginning, because we know that there are an incredible number of social determinants of health that this program, as much as it's built on relationships, isn't able to solve alone. And in fact, one third of patients who enter the study saying they want this care never really engage with us. So with the support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we built a new program we call the Comprehensive Care Community and Culture Program. We start with the program itself, the Comprehensive Care Program, and then we add to it systematic screening for unmet needs, access to a community health worker who builds a relationship with the patient to engage them with social services, and then finally, access to community-based arts programming to activate the patient and get them engaged in their own care. This is the conceptual model of what we're doing. We start with high-risk patients, some of which are activated and ready to engage in their own care, and they do so already along that top pathway, and they benefit from the program. But others on the bottom there are not activated. They're not even ready to help themselves. With this program and the C4P program, we get them activated and then get them engaged. And I resisted the urge to show you our pilot data from um, our um, smaller randomized trial, but I will tell you these 20% reductions are small from the study we've done before compared to what we're seeing in the pile of this. So I believe you can truly transform lives with this. I want to just end by giving credit to some of the Harris School activities that have been critical to this. As we've built this program to address unmet needs, the Harris School students have been intimately involved in helping us measure these unmet needs in food and housing and money and child support and legal assistance. They've helped us learn that these needs are incredibly concentrated in a small number of people who have many, many needs. 
So the idea that you can refer them need by need to program after program and expect that they're going to engage is wildly unrealistic. So we've analyzed this data carefully in good Harris School style and identified clusters of deeds so that we can address them together. On the far right there, there's a group that has very few needs, but the other four groups are groups of high needs. One group that has almost everything wrong, one group that has problems with food and healthy living and exercise, one that has financial challenges, and one interesting but small but interesting cluster about issues with children and legal needs. And so we've designed tailored interventions aimed for these groups. Um, a social service alignment, well actually I'll start on the other side, child-related need group, a health, and uh, um, in health insurance and financial needs group, a healthy living group, and then on the far left here, this sort of group where everything is wrong, many basic needs unmet. And there we're working with the social service sector to bring together a whole consortium of organizations, literally targeting all these 17 areas of needs to try to figure out how can these organizations work together. And the key lesson that has come out of this is exactly the same lesson we've learned about healthcare. It's all about relationships. Human beings in challenging situations need people they can count on. And when the healthcare system is fragmented, when the social service delivery system is fragmented, they do not get those relationships. And so we are starting to talk with these organizations about how they can work together to give people a smaller number of people who can do more for them rather than a large number of people who really can't do very much. And I think that is the end of my flash.